Good morning, everybody, and welcome to our Memphis Grizzlies webinars and careers in sports. My name is Pete Pranick. I've been the television voice for the Memphis Grizzlies now for 16 years and 27 years in the NBA, and I will be your moderator for today's program. We have a really good panel lined up for you today, and our goal today is to make sure that you hear firsthand from people who have a long career in sports so that you can learn a little bit more about what sports is like. It's a little bit more than the toy department uh, of life, but there are a lot of fun and games, that's true, but there's also a lot of serious business to be done as well. Our panelists today include John Pugliese, who is the Vice President of Broadcast and Production and also the Executive Producer of Grind City Media. And also joining me in our studio is Laura Errett. Laura is the Vice President of Communications and Basketball Information Strategy and comes to us not only from the NBA League office, but also St. Jude Children's Research Hospital. We'll get everybody to tell, tell us more about themselves as we go on. Joining us via Skype is Dwight Johnson. He's the Vice President of Arena Operations here at FedEx Forum. And Dennis O'Connor is our Vice President of Ticket Sales and Service. So those are the names. Now let's learn the stories behind the names. And John, I'm going to start with you. Uh, John, you are an original from the Vancouver days. So give us a little bit of your background and how you ended up in pro sports. Well, you just stole my thunder, Pete. <laughs> I started with the team in uh, 1998, and uh, which is um, coming out of my last year of college at University of British Columbia in Vancouver. And I started as an assistant coordinator of game presentation. So literally my first day on the job, I was rolling t-shirts and taping them for slingshots. I was cleaning up storage and cataloging game props for Grizz, our dance team at the time, and all sorts of things. And over the years, you know, I've been able to kind of take on different responsibilities and kind of grow. And I was one of the about 20 people who made the move from Vancouver to Memphis. Uh, 20 seasons ago now and actually as we enter into our 20th anniversary here with the Grizzlies in Memphis um, are able to celebrate that and one of two people still left with the franchise from a full-time basis myself and uh, Chantal Hassard our vice president of player programs in the locker room so um, that's kind of been my career path and right now I kind of oversee a few different departments including uh, social production that's broadcast TV radio but also um, all the videos and content that you see coming out, whether that's through our social channels, YouTube, uh, across our broadcasts on grizzlies.com, grindcitymedia.com. And as you alluded to, um, help lead our uh, Grind City Media productions. So that's all your, our live broadcasts, Rise and Grind uh, with Jessica and Megan, Chris Vernon Show, IMHO featured podcasts, et cetera. So we've got kind of a large breadth of content and kind of all fall under and wrap up under a couple departments I oversee. Uh, Laura, give us your origin story. Sure, of course. I um, actually grew up in Northeast Alabama, but have lived outside of there longer than I live there, um, which tells a little bit about my age and my level of experience, I will call it. Um, went to Troy State University and was a journalism and advertising major um, and thought I was going to be a sports journalist. I thought I was going to follow in your shoes, Pete, um, but instead found my way into the PR world. And uh, you know, sort of full circle that I'm sure we'll share the whole story. And then I joined the organization a little over a year ago and I lead our communications efforts. And that includes both um, all of our basketball and basketball operations communications, as well as FedEx Forum, and then all of our business and, uh, um, you know, partnership opportunities that fall under there as well. Dwight, give us a sense of, of where you've been. You've got a big job working FedEx Forum, which is still one of the prime venues in all of sports. So I started out, I'm, I'm from Louisiana, uh, went to LSU for college and, 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 and realized that, you know, I was going to be an engineer, you know, that was my goal, that was my dream job, and, and got entwined in the sports world at the Pete Maverick Assembly Center and fell in love with it. From that day on, I, I decided that I wanted to be in arenas and sports management and, and, and just continue to grow in that field. So it's, it's just been, it's been a, a joy ride from, from my first job in, in Baton Rouge to, to the Richmond Coliseum in Richmond. And, and then we opened up a training camp facility for the Redskins. So I got to see a lot of different facilities and have enjoyed my time here in Memphis at FedEx Forum. And Dwight, you're very detail-oriented. You got the, the, the can of Lysol on the desk, so you, you are absolutely ready. You are on point today. Appreciate that. Uh, Dennis O'Connor is our Vice President of um, Ticket Sales and Service. And Dennis, you've been with, with the club for, for quite a while. Give us a sense of where you came from. I've, I've, the, the Richmond Spiders, is that part of your background? Am I remembering that right? The University of Richmond. Uh, where I had no clue what I wanted to do. So I majored in economics, um, which uh, 
didn't provide me much of a basis for selling tickets, but uh, we'll get to that later. But uh, went to Richmond, um, ended up getting a master's in sports administration, which uh, gave me a little bit of background into, into professional sports, um, bounced around a bunch, um, and eventually landed in Memphis when the team moved from Vancouver. So not quite as long as, as John's been here, but I've been in Memphis the entire time. Um, and now I'm as vice president of ticket sales and service, which in a nutshell means we sell every responsible for selling every ticket that comes to the building, whether that's um, on the Grizzly side of things or um, helping out on concerts and even Tigers, Memphis Tigers basketball on the premium side of things. Now, one of the things that we want, and you, you told us your origin stories, but I, I want to sharpen the focus a little bit. Um, Dwight, did you always think that you were going to work in sports? Was this something that from the time you were at LSU said, yeah, this is this is the industry I want to be in? So uh, I started, you know, in high school, I've, I've always played basketball. I've always played sports. I, you know, it was something that I loved. I had passion for. My family had passion for. And, you know, at first you go to college and you, you dream big, you know, oh, I want to be an engineer. And, and, and then you start to, to get back into working in a facility like I was doing. It's like, man, I, I miss the sports world. I want to be around it. And it's just it's something that you want to be around every day. And, and I, love, I love basketball. So for, for me, being in a sports, yeah, I'm on a, on a facility side of sports, but I'm still, I'm still with sports. And it's something that I always wanted to do as a kid. I always grew up, you know, talking about basketball and, and, and just, just playing it. And, and it's, just, it's just exciting, you know, to be a part of it every day. Very good. Laura, you said that you wanted to be a sports journalist and kind of took a veer and you spent some time at St. Jude. So when did the, when did the spark really begin that, yeah, sports is really where I want to be? Oh, my gosh. Um, for me, probably – um, middle school to early high school and like I was an athlete growing up and then was sage advice from someone to say nobody's going to pay you Laura to do that for the rest of your life so you need to find a different way to do that and um, so after college um, I was lucky to an internship they hired me and it was for a sports publication um, and I quickly found that I love to write I love to tell stories but I preferred the sort of proactive side versus the um, uh, the journalistic invasive sort of side and then just sort of follow where my career took me and so um, I had two quick jobs and then I found an agency that I absolutely fell in love with and spent probably 14 years there and went from public relations to strategic planning corporate work we did a lot of motorsports work back then um, and then I was lucky enough to find my way to the NBA league office um, in New York and got to uh, spend some time in basketball full-time and it was phenomenal move for me it was hard because i left a lot of people that i love but it was really really um the right move for me and then memphis i got here as you mentioned um i took a sort of you know life decision to go take a give back job and i was a fundraiser for St. Jude Children's Research Hospital, looking after their um, all their sports properties. And then serendipitously, this opportunity with the Grizzlies came up and I had the opportunity to stay in Memphis, which I loved, and to get back into communications, which I loved, and then the NBA, which I also enjoyed greatly. So it's been a fun ride and I've got to be on a lot of different sides of sports, which has been fun, um, but it's good to be back here where it feels like it's where I'm meant to be. All things merge into one and a river runs through it. That's right. As, as they say, uh, yep. Norman McLean. Um, Dennis, you said that, that when you were at Richmond, it's like, I'm not really sure what I wanted to do. So when, when did the light finally come on that, okay, sports is the industry that I, I want to put this economics degree to use? Yeah. Um, you know, really, it's my junior year. I was, I was flipping through a course catalog and, and lo and behold, found that, that Richmond had a minor at the time in sports management. And uh, I said, I like sports. I think I'd be a good manager. So let's put the two together. I started taking some classes um, and then as I mentioned, got my master's uh, after I graduated at Richmond. Um, still really, I didn't know what sports management was all about, but I needed a job uh, during my master's year and answered an ad to work for the Richmond Renegades, which was uh, an old minor league hockey team in Richmond. Uh, actually played at the building that Dwight ended up running down the road, but um, answered an ad to sell tickets. Um, and uh, my training was basically they gave me a, a stack of index cards with names of executives on it and said, here you go, sell five game plans for the Richmond Renegades. Uh, no real training, but I uh, was fortunate enough to have some success and, uh, and worked my way up from a, uh, basically a glorified internship with the Renegades to a, a full time job while I was at school and then parlayed that into moving on up through the, the world of minor league sports um, in L.A. and then Salt Lake City 
and then uh, eventually to Memphis when the team moved here. Now, we should tell everybody that John is a native Canadian and quite, quite, quite the curler, but professional curling opportunities. When, when did you know that curling wasn't going to work out as a, as, a, as a career path and sports would be the, where you'd want to go? Well, I grew up playing <laughs> hockey. Okay. And then, then I, you realized I, curling? Play, I realized I couldn't play hockey very well. And then, uh, no, I played hockey for years, and then I tried curling, but, you know, everyone tries curling in Canada. Um, but, uh, no, I went to the University of British Columbia, and I st studied finance. I got a Bachelor of Commerce degree uh, from there and really didn't even think about sports. But while I was going to university, I was working uh, for a number of companies doing live event marketing. Uh, so Mountain Dew, Burton Snowboards, uh, Pepsi, uh, m promoting mug root beer, um, doing these little pop-up events all over the British Columbia in Canada. And that's where I got in contact with um, a few of the people that worked at the Vancouver Canucks and Grizzlies at the time. And the person who hired me on uh, to, to work for Pepsi went over to the uh, Canucks at the moment. And when his job came available, he called and said, hey, would you be interested? I worked very hard for him, worked with him for a long time. Um, and I never really thought about sports. But I was coming to the end of my college career, and I had to go somewhere. To, very much like Dennis, I needed a job. And working for the Canucks and Grizzlies in Vancouver obviously was an amazing opportunity. But once I got in there, I just fell in love with it. And I couldn't imagine looking at stock sheets and, and uh, the NASDAQ and st exchanges every single day and trying to figure out uh, that type of, uh, type of work. And honestly, the more I get past it, the less I even remember. Thank God for brokers nowadays and my friends who can tell me what to invest in. But uh, no, I really, I kind of lucked into it based upon some part-time work I was doing and found the right opportunity with a great organization at the time. And, 27 year, 20, 24 years later, I'm here. You're, so. you're still here. <laughs> yep. um, all of you have had the opportunity at some point to interview somebody for a job, all right? And everybody out there watching aspires to a, a career in sports. And obviously, there's going to be a gatekeeper. There's going to be a decision maker. So, Dennis, I'm going to start with you on this one. Uh, obviously, you know, you hire a lot of young people as ticket sellers. So, give me... Two things. First of all, what impresses you in an interview when somebody walks into your office, and what is the most common mistake that a young person may make in an interview when you're deciding if, if you're going to hire them as an account executive or a ticket salesperson? Sure. I think uh, what impresses me is confidence. Uh, you know, obviously, we've all been doing this a long time. Uh, it's intimidating for uh, someone right out of school uh, to, to come talk to us. Um, so you have to exude some confidence. You're going to be in a setting in, in my world where you're talking to CEOs and, and executives. Um, and if you can't talk to me, how are you going to be able to do that? Um, and similarly, you have to be able to sell yourself. If you can't uh, talk about yourself confidently in an interview with me, how are you going to sell Grizzlies tickets uh, to somebody? So confidence is definitely something that impresses me. Um, attitude also is up there. Um, in terms of mistakes, uh, not being prepared. Uh, you know, whether that's, believe it or not, people come to an interview and, and don't look or aren't dressed professionally. You know, you're, you're trying to, again, sell yourself, look the part. Um, but also, um, not do your homework. Learn something about me, our organization, so you can speak intelligently about the position you're, you're interviewing for. And be prepared to ask questions, you know. Um, dig, dig a little bit deeper, ask about me or, or, or our organization, and so you can decide if it's the right fit for you going forward. Dwight, what about you? You've worked in a number of, of venues, and if you're working in arena operations, you have everybody from conversion crew to cleaning crew to all kinds of people looking out for the safety and the welfare of the people who come to your particular venue. When you are interviewing, what do you look for, and what are some mistakes that you've seen people make when they come in to interview with you? I want to touch on a couple of things that Dennis said. You know, the first one and the most important one is, is, is having that confidence to walk in the room and, and just being able to sit down and communicate the, the act, the, just sell yourself, you know, just talk, just talk about all the good things you do, all the, all the things you do well. And, and I think a lot of people sometimes come in and, and if they aren't prepared or they haven't studied enough and researched the job or understand the job description, they think that the job is something that is not really 
it's not the same. And, and it, it sometimes it backfire on them because they're not prepared for it and then they're just not ready for it. But I'd like if you if you come and, and you, you come dress and you, you just you just show that confidence, it just it just makes the interview go go really, really well. And, and sometimes people also get too comfortable in their interview where they forget that they're interviewing for a job and, and they they lose focus. And, and it just sometimes it hurts. Them. John, what have, what have you found? Because, I mean, you've interviewed people for game presentation for any number of things in your career. What are, what are, the, what are the things that sets a candidate apart and, and something that may send somebody to the bottom of your list? You know, I think, as Dennis and Dwight both said, preparedness. And I usually ask, like, a couple of questions that really lead into that. And honestly, I want someone to take a look at the job description, take a, if they've had a phone screen, and then I want them to describe back to me what they feel a day is going to be like in their job. I want them to have a base understanding and a strong understanding. And if they can come in with something like that, and as I ask them that question, can really to deliver a, a confident answer. Um, there are times when you get people that go, oh, I was hoping to ask you that question. Well, if you don't have that understanding coming into this interview of what you think your day-to-day -day might feel like and look like, you might not be the right fit for that job. On the, on the mistake side of things, I think, um, people come in and say, hey, I'm just really excited to work in sports. Sometimes th that can work against you because there's, we get 200 resumes for every job we put out there no matter what it is. Everyone's excited to work in sports. I want someone who's passionate about that particular job, who has expertise in that particular job, and wants to excel in that, but also sees himself developing a career path. And I think you need to be able to deliver that in an interview and not just be there because it's the Memphis Grizzlies or because it's a, a career in sports. You need to be able to deliver your passion and come through confident in that and be prepared, as I said also. And really be able to make yeah. a connection. Now, Laura, when you interview somebody, Pratt Falls and uh, things that will elevate somebody's application. Sure. So a lot of what John said would be very similar for me. I have immediately sort of turn my brain off in interviews where there's like, I'm a fan. Like, okay, well, we you all? can't, right, exactly. <laughs> it's like, that will be great when you're watching, but when you have to get down and dirty, say the hard things, do the hard things, have the hard conversations, being a fan isn't, doesn't even come into play really there. And the other I would say is um, too much confidence because I have also had people come in and would just tell me like that they had all, I'm talking about like to the um, folks watching now, fresh out of college that have all the answers and they know absolutely everything. And I'm like, okay, <laughs> I'm 25 plus years into this. I like, you know, I'm happy to learn, but I'm sure you, I don't know everything after all that. Um, so I think that, and I also think if you have, um, if you're able to display like some practical experience, if you work through college at um, the SID department at the you know college you know paper website what it might be like some of that really practical experience to me goes a tremendous distance as far as like giving you a leg up on everyone as well. Okay, uh, let's move on here, John. Let's go back to uh, a younger version of John Pugliese. <laughs> um, if you could go back. 25 years or so and give your younger self a piece of advice at the start of your career what advice would you give yourself beyond working out more <laughs> and trying to stay in better shape um, throughout my 20 40 plus years of life no I I think um, something I would uh, give to, to students, and, and it, it's really hard to look back and reflect upon myself because I really have enjoyed my career path and the decisions I've made to get where I'm at. But I think getting in and working hard and being willing to do the dirty work, you can't be above that. You've got to get your hands dirty and understand the product, whatever that product may be, from the base up. So if that is rolling t-shirts and doing inventory of game ops products, if that is writing press releases, if that is pulling cable, if that, whatever that may be, setting up chairs, understanding each of those process will make you better informed and, and help you down your career path and whatever that's gonna be. Because at some point, you're not just gonna have this insular position, you're gonna have to interact with everyone across the company and have an understanding of what they do and what their needs are, whether that company is the Memphis Grizzlies or, or, or FedEx. So it's really important just to get in there and work as hard as you can. Uh, and learn as much as you can and absorb. So. Yes, to, to know all the moving parts of, of mm -hmm. everything. And, and Dwight, that's got to be particularly uh, appropriate for you because there are so many moving par parts in a sports and entertainment venue. If you go back to your days at LSU, what advice would you give that LSU uh, undergrad? 
So I, I would say, like Puck said, you, you want to do everything. There's There wasn't a job that I thought I was too good to do. You know, I started at the bottom and I worked my way up the ranks. And what, what I always tell people is, is, is learn everything. Like try and, uh, try and be a part of everything. Volunteer yourself, volunteer your time. I know it may not be part of your job, but if you, you can understand what's going on on the broadcast side or what's going on on, on this side of things, on the, the team, just, just do as much as you can to learn new techniques and, and understand what other departments are going through and, and, and just constantly grow. The other thing that I will say, and this is, this is my advice for a younger me, is, is, is that, that home work-life balance it is a balance and you, you really, you know, you really have to take a look at that as you get older and, and make sure you, you're focused on your career, you focus on your, on your, on your, your growth in your career, but also have a balance with your home life because that's also important too. Yeah. And Dwight, you make a very, very important point. And I think that it's very easy if you have not been in this industry before and you think hey, it's a lot of, it's a lot of fun and games. And yes, it is. If you think it's going to be a 40 hour a week job with regular hours, no, no, not not even close. Now, is that something you would have told yourself when you were coming out of Troy? You know, I think that one I understood because I was working with a, a school newspaper at the time, back so when there knew. were newspapers, so <laughs> I sort of knew that. Um, so that one I sort of got, but I do tell, I ask, like, if I speak to students now, I ask them, I was like, how much do you love your nights and weekends? Oh, my God, I love them a lot. Well, you're going to need to think about <laughs> yeah. that because that is going to be um, a hard one. As far as like advice that I would give to young to my younger self, it's actually advice that I give to people now. And I tell them like, if you have an opportunity, say yes to the opportunity. If it means moving away, it's fine. Like nothing is forever. Um, I remember when I got my first internship and it was working in NASCAR. I always say back in NASCAR when it was like second to the NFL in ratings. Mm -hmm. I always like to caveat that. And um, I said, what's that? Because I didn't have a clue, but I was like, great, I'll take it. And that led to my first job, which led to a change in my direction and career, which has led me sort of to where I am. So always say yes. You can do anything for 18 months. And to every, what everyone has said, the level of experience that you'll get and the vast knowledge you'll get will be well worth it down the path. Yeah, and that, mm -hmm. that's one of the questions that I get very frequently from young broadcasters. You know, what do I do? Well, get reps, number one. Mm -hmm. And number two, never turn down an assignment. If you don't know what the sport is, that's what Wikipedia is for. <laughs> Look it up and, right. and, and figure it out. Correct. And um, yeah, never turn down an opportunity. Uh, Dennis, what advice would you give somebody who, uh, who wants to get into the business? And what advice would you have given yourself when you were at Richmond? I think uh, for myself, it's it's something I try to do now, and I, I didn't do it nearly as much uh, at the start of my career. But it's it's challenge yourself to get better every day. Um, you know, now I, I try to read books or podcasts or, or or go on seminars where you where you're learning something and getting better at your craft. And I think when I was younger, I I didn't do any of that, and I think I could have I could have maybe advanced a little quicker or gotten better faster um, by uh, reading more and, and listening to others and and uh, and just continuing to study outside of, outside of, out of college. Um, advice for kids breaking in, it's, people have said it, but um, volunteer, network, um, you, have to, you have to grow your brand and, and you're not gonna do that by sitting at home. Uh, you have to get out of your comfort zone and try new things and uh, talk to people and, and doors will open for you. And I think with, with the networking advice, Dennis, that you had mentioned and you also touched on this as well is, if you are going to network, present yourself as a professional. It doesn't mean coat and tie everywhere or blouse and skirt everywhere, but people will always remember you if you act professionally and you act respectfully. And that's another thing that when young broadcasters come to me and say, well, you know, what should I remember? Part of it is you never know about the person you meet tomorrow and the impact they may have on your career somewhere down the line. So treating everybody professionally and with respect, I, I, I think, and I've found to be, is, is incredibly important. Um, Dwight, you made an interesting point earlier about the work-life balance. And what I want to uh, broach with our panel here is some of the challenges. Because everybody thinks, again, sports, fun and games. Well, there are difficulties. There are challenges. So Dwight, give me a sense of, of some of the challenges that you have faced in your career and what you've done to deal with those. So it's, it's funny, I always talk about that. I always like to remind everyone, 
we do we we work as hard from 7 p.m. to sometimes 2 and 3 o'clock in the morning as people work from 9 to 5. So I always, always bring that up to people because people don't realize what it takes to, to get the facility ready from one event to the next. But, you know, for me, challenges, one, one of my biggest challenges is, is as a kid, I had a speech problem. And for me to sit here today and, and to, to be here on this webinar right now, it, it, it's – I. I'm excited about it because because that's that's one of my biggest challenges. I used to be afraid to go in front of, of people and talk. Now I do it all the time. I, I actually enjoy doing it. So so for me, I, I like to always tell people that there's no challenge that you can't overcome if you really put your mind to it and work hard at it. And, and, and that's what that's what we do. You know, I, I feel like you have to work hard at everything you do every day because every day there's a new challenge in our business. No day is the same when it comes to the arena. Every day we face some new challenges that on this event is different than the next day. And, and we just come together and prepare ourselves and just work through it. And, and, and that's just that's just the world we live in now. Dennis, let me turn it over to you. Uh, a lot of challenges, and I know obviously with COVID-19 and the fact that uh, you know we lost a good portion of the season and the few games that were played were played in the bubble. So ticket sales, that had to be an incredible challenge. Talk about that type of challenge and the things that you've had to deal with in your career in terms of challenges? Yeah, I think Dwight, Dwight said something, new challenges come up every day. And I, I think um, going back to March, we were prepping for a playoff run and, and a, a huge influx of new season ticket holders and excitement um, around our team. And all of a sudden it came crashing down and, and lo and behold, seven, eight months later, we're, we're still in it. So. Um, no one's had to deal with that before. So that's the biggest challenge we're doing right now. And, and now it's talking about social distancing manifest. I mean, who would have thought eight months ago, no one knew what social distancing was. And now we're trying to create a seating chart to keep people safe from each other. So uh, we're rewriting a book um, and hopefully we'll, we'll look back at this um, down the road and, and come out of it ahead of things. But, um, you know, the other a challenge uh, that we face in Memphis, it's just it's it's the Memphis market. It's a small market. When you look at who we're competing against, it's we're not LA, we're not New York, we're not Chicago, we're not Houston. And those are some of the biggest cities in the world. Um, and Memphis, while it's a great city, a great place to live, it's not huge. So from a ticket sales side of things, we really need to take a look at, at how we do things and what works in San Francisco or LA isn't going to work in Memphis. We have to be a little more uh, filled with Southern charm, so to speak, and, and look at um, uh, how we're pricing things. Uh, differently than some of those larger markets. And I think, fortunately, we've, we've done a good job of that and, and are making our name for ourselves, even though we're in one of the smaller markets in professional sports. Yeah, and I think it's also important that no matter what role you play in a sporting organization, Laura, you need to understand your audience, what they need, and how you can address their needs. What are some of the biggest challenges that you faced in, in your sports career? That is a loaded question because <laughs> <laughs> I think back, like, because I am the motorsport space, um, it was like I did everything from, you know, hospital visits and driver injuries and to the same as, like, you know, unsettled partners who walked in on game day that said, nope, we're changing everything. And you have to be like, all righty, we're changing everything. Let's figure out how to do that. And so um, I think the challenges are like so immense, it's hard to actually like list what a couple of them would be. So I think I would sort of flip it and say the skill is to learn how to like pivot and stay calm. That that is served me well to this day. The great analogy is to be like a duck where you're gliding across the water and you're paddling as hard as you can underneath just for no one to see it. And so, um, yeah, I think this business, whether it is weather or personalities or media or a pandemic for all the things, um, that it's going to be something, but you got to assume that there's going to be something every day that will rock your day, that you will walk in with your to-do list. And then, you know, second hour, you're like, all right, well, I'm going to put this for three days from now and let's focus on this. So I think it's the ability to pivot and remain sort of calm and even healed is key. Yeah, I think somebody's even said you can't control the waves, you just have to learn how to surf. Yes, that's yeah. a, yes. You just you just have to Correct. kind of kind of go with the flow. I mean, John, in your career, you you have dealt with a lot of things, not the least of which is the pandemic, of course, but also the relocation of a franchise from Vancouver to Memphis. Totally different audience different country uh how did how did that rank among the challenges that you've dealt with in your career well i think 
when the decision was made, and that was probably in late April of, of 2001, um, our staff was cut down greatly at that point. We knew that there was gonna be 20 people coming down to Memphis and we were gonna to have to build a staff of 100 and have a game ready to go by October 1st. And that was one of those opportunities that we all kind of talked about where we all wore multiple hats. At the time, I was coming down as a manager of promotions and game entertainments, and game entertainment and promotions were important. But I was also selling Memphis Grizzlies merchandise out of our boardroom. Uh, at the same time, I was also, you know, we were we were doing we were setting chairs and helping with arena conversions. We were learning so many different things at the time, and so that being able to be flexible and really get your hands dirty no matter what your title is or what department you're in and help across those is 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 a huge plus but also a great challenge because you still have to you're still expected to deliver on your job at a high level um and i think something laura said about being able to pivot you know problem solving is a huge thing and the problems might not always be hey uh, player a did something wrong and it's a public thing or player a broke his broke his ankle and we have to deal with that, but it, it, it could be something that people don't see, especially from a live production standpoint. As you know, Pete, on TV, you're dealing with hiccups all the time, and you've got producers who are problem solving. You've got a problem solve on your feet, um, and we all have to do that every day. So there's definitely a lot, a lot there that, that can help, and if you have that skill set to problem solve, I think this is a great industry for you because it definitely changes. Me personally, and a challenge I had, um, being with the team for 20 plus years, I've had to kind of evolve my own personal brand and how I am perceived as I've grown from this fun, basic intern to more of an executive leader. And I think that's hard to do. And you've got to be able to evolve yourself as you're going through all these uh, different years and all these different jobs that you may have. And to that point of what Dennis was making, if you can learn, you can step outside yourself and look back at yourself and what you're doing and learn from outside sources, whether that's podcasts, books, webinars, et cetera, that's a really important thing, but that's definitely been a challenge for me in my career because being with the same organization, I've had to grow within that. And dealing with the challenges that come with the growth and from being the guy who wraps up the t-shirts to now being a vice president. Yeah, exactly. Okay. Uh, let's get a little philosophical here, and then we're actually going to get into some questions that you have submitted to us because we have some time for that. Um, Laura, how do you define yeah. success <laughs> In your role, because it's it's not wins and losses or tickets sold, it's getting out information. So what would what would I what mean? Would you it kind of is. I think Dennis would say that it's probably a little bit that. <laughs> John would say it's a little bit that for you know viewership numbers, whatever it might. So I think that is um, uh, it, it. It is hard to define. It genuinely is, and so uh, if. Um, yeah, I mean, you're constantly feeling like, what about, what if, like, people can be unhappy and I expect them to be unhappy and I hope that they're not, but um, I think there's always a way to sort of get around that. So I think it is hard um, to uh, define success um, amongst your peers and sort of doing your role. But then I also sort of looked a little bit sort of introspective to say, like, what does success look like to me now at this point in my career? Um, and it's been, um, I've had the opportunity in my previous role, um, particularly to really mentor a lot of younger individuals and to take them and sort of help give them, uh, <laughs> it sounds um, strange to say like life experience, mm -hmm. whatever those you know tips and tricks could be to help them along. Um, that if I'm able to do that and make a difference, like maybe that is my age and my tenure, but I have found that that is very um, rewarding. We call, that, we call that wisdom. Wisdom, thanks, <laughs> wisdom. I'll take yes. that. We'll, 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 we'll go with <laughs> Wisdom. Great, um, Dwight. What what is what is success for you in in operating a building like FedEx Forum? So for me, in operating a building, the success for uh, for us has always been. You know, I, I love seeing an event start from pretty much a concrete floor to to a successful concert where you know we have all kinds of challenges, but the the patron, the fans, they never know what we go through to get to that end result. And to watch the fans you know, excited and cheering and, and it's just enjoying the show. That's the success for me on the, on the event side of it. You no, know, and, and on, on a personal level, you know, it, it, it's, it's, it's that same satisfaction though, know, you know, to see what, what you've worked so hard on that day or, or, or that week, to see it to come to, you know, the end of it and, and, and to be so enjoyable and to have people come out and spend their, their, they're off time with us, you know. We're entertaining people, and, and that's what we get to do for a living, and, and, and that's exciting, and, uh, and that's enjoyable. 
So that's kind of, you know, for me, success is that that end result of those those events from basketball game to concert. It's just it's just just a just to be able to see people enjoy that process. It's just it's just great. Now, Dennis, from from your chair, it's very, very quantifiable. You want a sold out building every night. So in addition to the numbers and making sure that the tickets are sold and the people who come to the building are happy, how, how do you define success either organizationally or for yourself in your role? Yeah, I, th I think uh, one of the owners I worked for at one point, um, we weren't doing very well. We weren't having a lot of success in terms of selling tickets. And we developed a plan to try to make us better. Um, and we laid it all out. It was a little scary because it was a little risky. Um, and at the end of that presentation, he turned to me and said, you know what, I applaud you for trying. What we're doing isn't working. Um, and I'm never going to um, I'm never going to fault you for trying to take a risk and making us better. Um, and, and so I think that goes putting forth an effort and at least trying. Um, you can control the process, um, which I, I think. Um, is, is what you need to do, especially, you can't necessarily control the results. Um, so while we all want to have sold out games, we know, uh, especially now this year, that a, a sold out building is probably not going to happen. Um, so what can we do to, to ensure that we're, we're getting the success uh, despite not necessarily selling every ticket? Um, and then in this role now too, I mean, we've talked about, a lot of my folks come to me right out of school. They're, they're younger, it's their first job. Um, so personally, I like, seeing growth from our employees and, and our staff and, and being able to see someone who might have started as an intern or um, in our inside sales program right out of college grow not only with me and, and hopefully get promoted but move on to other op other opportunities and bigger and better roles you know in sports we all know everyone here talked about their journey everyone's moved so people have to move around to get promoted in this business and uh, i take a lot of pride in the fact that a lot of folks that have worked for me are, are now in other organizations and other teams in, in management roles and um, have grown personally and, and hopefully I played a little part in, in getting them there. Yeah, I think everybody on the panel has mentored somebody at some point and they've gone on to other organizations and have been successful. Um, we have some, some questions that have been sent in and uh, kind of playing off what Dennis was talking about. Uh, and it was also brought up, I think, John, you brought it up. Brad Moylan from Santa Rosa Junior College wants to know, about the specific skills and qualities that make a resume stand out. Because like you said, John, there, there's an opening with the Grizzlies and there are literally, I mean, this is not an exaggeration, there are hundreds of resumes. Yeah. How does somebody get a resume to stand out? The first thing I look for is, is applicable job experience. If you can show that right off the very top, um, even though the education background is important, if you have applicable experience, that's the first thing I, I look for on a resume, uh, especially to that specific role. Um, and then really a little bit of creativity in any sort of CV cover letter that could come along that might spark the attention or really to show me again within that first level of communication, whether it's in the resume or whether cover letter or that email to me personally that you understand this role and what you can offer to it. Those are kind of the things I'm looking for right from the get-go. Yeah, if you get a, a cover letter that starts out, dear sir slash madam. I'm out. You're, you're I'm out. out, you're out, you're out. You're, 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 you're done with that. Or they spell Grizzlies wrong. Or they spell Grizzlies wrong, yes. Yeah. Dwight, when, when somebody approaches you because you have an opening on the arena staff and you've got that stack of resumes, what jumps out at you that says, okay, well, I'm gonna set this on this pot because I wanna talk to this person? Well, it's, it's, I, I will agree with what, what John said. It's, it's having that arena experience is, is an important part in, in understanding that that, that concept of, of what you're going to do. The other thing is I, I like stability. You know, looking at a, a resume and, and seeing some some years at a certain job or or you know just some stability there. It's not it's not someone that's changing the job every three to six months. You know, so so those things are important to us, we're, especially when we're looking at comparing other resumes. Dennis, what about you? I mean, you, you look at a lot of resumes from a lot of young people that maybe haven't had ticket sales experience. How do you cull through those resumes to find somebody that you think will be effective as a representative for the Grizzlies in terms of selling tickets? Yeah, I think what I try to look for is, and you don't see it on a resume, but passion or willingness to be in this industry. And like you said, in, in high school or college, you're, you're not necessarily selling tickets a lot, but what are you, what are you doing to show that you want to get in this in this business, you know, did you volunteer at your uh, school in the athletic department, and as John said, throwing T-shirts or, or doing something to get your foot in the door in in, in this profession? And um, uh, you know, so just 
tr making an extra effort to, to, to show that you want to be in the world of professional athletics. Laura, what stands out to you when, when you get a resume from somebody? Yeah, so a couple of the others hit on the number one. So one is sort of, I would call it willingness to work, just exactly like, you know, uh, internships, volunteering, just the willingness to say, because if you're going to go from, I've never worked a day in my life till you're going to work, you know, <laughs> 60 40, hours 40, a week. That's right, 41 home <laughs> games. That's a, that's a shock to your system. So I think that, and then Dwight on the um, sort of job hopping. I um, was interviewing for a position a couple years ago and a resume made it to me through HR and it literally was every 18 months was something different. I'm like, why would you even send me that? Because in 18 months they're going to be gone and so what's going to make it any difference? So that's when I think that that matters to me as well. All right. So, Brett, we thank you for that question. Um, Tyler Jacobs from Southern Miss wants to know, and this is very specific, uh, Dwight, so this one's going to go to you and you alone. Uh, Tyler says, I'm looking at going into safety and security. What skills do you see most entry level or newly graduated employees, potential employees, lacking when, when they would be looking for a job in, in safety and security? I, I think the, the most important thing is 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 internships and, and and being able to to gain some growth by volunteering with a security company while you're in college to understand what it takes to do the job uh i think if you have the willingness to try and the willingness to learn i, I think you can put yourself through because there's a lot of training courses that you can do that that would be great to help you get to a good understanding of what it takes to get the job done or what it takes to start that position. And I think I think that's that's one of the biggest failures a lot of college kids fail to do is is, is take advantage of of the membership groups like for, for for me it's IEVM, which is a membership group for arena managers, our, our our security parts. There's training courses, there's a lot of opportunities there that you should take advantage of while you have the opportunity, especially while you're in college. Tyler, you just got the best answer you could possibly get. So, Tyler, we thank you for that question. Uh, Christian Evans from the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign is a graduate student, and um, he wants everybody on the panel to weigh in with this. And I think we've, we've kind of touched on this at some point, but at what point in your career did you understand that sports wasn't just like, hey, this is pretty cool, like, no, this is a passion. I have to do this. This is this is something that feeds my soul. Laura? Yeah, sure. Um, I think it was probably when I understood that it was a business. And there are a lot of different sides of that as a business. There's communication side. There's the broadcast side. There's the arena side. That when you look at it from all those um, angles and you're like, this is... I mean, it's you know, dozens of businesses all put together. But when you appreciate that as a business, I think it's when I said this feeds not only my passion for sports, but my passion for business as well as when it probably clicked and I said this is my forever place to be. Gotcha. Dennis, what about, uh, what about your role in sports and when did it become a passion and not just simply a, a nine to five job? Yeah, I think it, like Laura, it was, it was early on. It was um, when I was in Richmond, again, I was selling tickets during the day. Um, but to make a little extra money, um, I also played the music at the arena during our games. Um, I never knew that existed. Like, I didn't know that, that. A lot that of Dave Matthews. A lot of Dave Matthews. <laughs> <laughs> um, but just to see that, you know, you, at that point, it, was, it wasn't all computerized yet. I put a cassette in. Um, <laughs> cassette, um, what's that? <laughs> um, but to see the reaction that people got by, you know, Obviously, when I was in hockey, there was some fights, and we'd play, you know, Saturday night is all right for fighting or whatever. That's not, I think it's Ellen Johnson or whatever that is. But um, people go crazy. Um, and to see the passion that um, people exuded at games and to know that you're a part of that um, wanted me to, to continue to have that success. And, and now uh, in, my, in my role, just being able to fill up that building and walking into that building for a playoff game or a big game and, and see that everyone's – so excited to be there and there's a, a sense of excitement in that building and know that uh, we played a major role in getting people there is, 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 is great. John, when did the, the passion really kick in? Well, I think you realize very early on and, and I'm going to be very frank to, and everyone's probably on this dais has, has seen this and honestly, uh, fr frank to the people watching is that there are other industries you will get paid more to do what you do. Mm -hmm. Uh, and that's the realistic. So what makes that difference between what you could get paid here versus some other industry, some other company? And it is that passion. It is that caring. It is the fun. It is what 
it is all the intangibles that come with working for a sports team. And right from the get-go, you, you recognize that, and that's why you, and you're in sports because of those intangibles, not for the paycheck. And, and that's when, if you realize that quickly, the hours don't even, you don't even notice the hours anymore. You better not notice the hours. You don't, you don't, you don't <laughs> notice the hours, and you don't notice that they add up over 20 years and your beard gets grayer and you get a little heavier, you get a little less hair. You don't notice that stuff because you just enjoy what you're doing. Um, sorry, Pete, I didn't mean <laughs> yeah, like that. Yeah, that's right. sure <laughs> <laughs> no, and I think that's the, uh, that goes back to the, the passion, and I think Dennis hit it on the head. There are some great gratifying times, and I remember one back in uh, our 2000, our first uh, significant playoff run, uh, when we were playing the Oklahoma City Thunder in the Western Conference semifinals. And it was late in the fourth quarter, Pete, and I'm sure you remember this moment, and Conley's at the line, and everyone holds up these Believe Memphis towels. And beyond the fact that the, the, the arena and the town was just ready to explode, that kind of visual, emotional response that you're getting from fans for something you're doing, whether it's game ops, promotions, branding, marketing, tagline, like it just all comes together and, and, and gives you this warm feeling like, wow, you really hit something on the head there. and that. And you come back for that feeling every single time, and you try to recreate that with a different group of players, a different group of fans, and that's what keeps me coming back every day. Yeah, because the hours and the pay, yeah, like, like John says, you, you could be better paid somewhere else working 8 to 5, but if you love working around the clock, but you have to want to do it. I mean, if yeah. lacking passion in the sports business is your ticket out of the sports business. Mm -hmm. I mean, otherwise, it, it, it just doesn't work because there's always somebody who's going to want to have a job in the sports business that may have more passion than you. So you've got to bring passion. And with that, Dwight, I want to know what what is what is your passion that I want to get in that building, I want to see my conversion crew doing stuff, I want to make sure everything is taken care of for Elton John or James Taylor or Memphis Tigers basketball or Grizzlies basketball. It's funny because I, I was sitting here listening to everybody and, and I'm thinking about the the time when I, I, it was a Garth Brooks concert for me and I was in college. I'm 18 years old and, and I was I was working security the entire time and I was sleeping actually underneath the stage because I worked a 24 hour show. And, and I just remember waking up and, and there, my guys calling me and say, hey, we do, it's time it's time to go back to work. And I'm saying, and I was sitting there and said, I get paid to do this. I get paid to work events. And it's just so exciting to see that that concept of of entertaining people and to be a part of it from the beginning. And it's just it's just exciting for me. And I love what I do every day. I always tell someone is, is when you find a job and, and you go to work and, and you, you have a job where when I, I don't enjoy what I do anymore, then maybe it's time for something else. But I enjoy what I do every day because every day is a new adventure. You know, I don't know what's going to happen. I could have a flood one day. I could have a great concert the next day. We could have a fire alarm go off the next day. It's always something new and some new adventure. Exactly. And, and, and I just enjoy doing it. Yeah, yeah. I mean, if you're looking for the straight eight to five, same thing day after day after day, John, you, you referenced looking at, at the stock market day after day, and there's nothing wrong with that. We need, we need stockbrokers. We need people in the financial, but, but this is not it. This, the sports industry is not that. Uh, Christian, we thank you for that question. Um, it's a pretty interesting question from Evan Lewis, and he says that he is a, uh, he's got a bachelor's degree in sports management at Kutztown University, and he's trying to figure out where do I fit into an organization like the Grizzlies? So if you're somebody, and Dennis, you, you have the master's in, in, in sports administration, if, if you have that degree and you're like, well, I'm not sure if I want to sell tickets or PR, or like, where, what, what's your first step trying to get a job in sports if you're not really sure what area you want to specialize in? So for me, I, selfishly, um, I always say sales, but um, <laughs> that, that's what I'm. Of course you would. <laughs> um, but I also think that um, either the, I think sales jobs are the most prevalent in sports. Like we have a very large staff, and so it might be it's easier to get your foot in the door. Um, and sales obviously isn't for everybody, but once you're in there, you can start talking to other people. You can talk to Lori. You can talk to John. Um, you can you can learn about what other facets of the organization that there are. And, and, and as we talk through networking and volunteering for everything, you know, Laura could have a, a PR, um, she needs help with PR for some, for some day or some event and you can help her out and, 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 and find that that's your passion. But um, to me, again, sales gives people a broad basis of what the organization looks like. And especially 
on the Grizzlies, it's great, but even on the minor league side of things, um, staffs are a lot smaller, um, and you, you're involved in a lot more than just your specific discipline. Laura, what about you? How do how would you have a, a young person come to you and say, "I'm not really sure what area of sports I want to work in. I just want to be in sports." What would you What would you advise? So the first I would say is like, "What are your natural abilities?" Because I assure you, no one wants me in the finance department for the Memphis Grizzlies. Whoa. I can manage. Whoa. I can manage a budget. Oh, <laughs> shout out Nancy Allier. That's right. I can I can manage my own budget, but I sure can't manage um, the entire budget for the entire organization. And salute to the ones that do. Um, so I think that there are things that you just have natural abilities, and you probably are naturally going to be drawn to a few things, you know, anyway. Um, and so I think follow those and just sort of look at all of them and talk to people to Dennis's point that um, have sort of a breadth of experience. You can ask questions and be like, mm, you know, probably not me, but woo, I'm really drawn to this and use that as a start. But to Dennis's point, I do think sales jobs are a great way to get started, to learn all sorts of the organization and to get an affinity for the revenue generating positions, which every organization will tell you is incredibly important. Um, so, yeah, but I think you can weed out what you're not going to be good at and mm -hmm. like self remove yourself from those opportunities as well. Mm -hmm. John, why don't you weigh in on this one? I, I'm going to be a little biased like Dennis was. <laughs> um, no, and I, I, I'm going to do it for a reason. Uh, game ops is, is a really kind of interesting area. It's tough to get in. So I agree with Dennis and, and what Laura said in regards to sales. There are more sales positions open up. At, uh, and if you can sell, you can get hired, period. It, uh, but for like a game ops position, you touch so many different groups. Um, you're touching, you're activating on sponsor agreements, you're, uh, you're promoting ticket sales, you're uh, setting up events, you're talking to broadcast group, you're talking to developing the brand and voice in arena. So there's a lot of different d departments that you touch at, at every level, whether you're the guy throwing out the t-shirt, well, it could be the t-shirt that's sponsored by Al Gossett, it could be the, uh, the half-court contest, and so now you're dealing with someone in sponsorship. You could be helping them set up a, uh, a community uh, check presentation, so you're getting a little bit of understanding of all these different departments. So I like that from trying to get a, a broad scope on the organization, but I definitely agree that there are more jobs in ticket sales and opportunities once you get into those jobs to branch out. Mm -hmm. Uh, Dwight, I'm going to let I'm going to let you handle this one as well. Somebody comes to you and they're like, you know, I want to be in sports, but I'm not really sure exactly where I want to go. What advice would you give them? Uh, for me, the first step would be, I would I, I would be open about what you're trying to do, but ask a ton of questions. So always ask questions, and, and I always want you to be a sponge. You know, so if someone offers you an opportunity, take it. As Dennis said, if it's in ticket sales, take it and, and then work your way through so you can understand what other people are doing, but be a sponge and volunteer yourself. Never say, I've, I've always been, there's no such thing as a no. We'll figure out, we'll figure it out and I our, our, our will learn from it. And, and that's what I always do. And, and, and that's what you have to do as, as coming up from working as a student worker, working my way up the ranks, there's no job I wouldn't do. So you should try everything and, and understand exactly what, what you like and don't like. So then as you get closer to where you want to be, you go after that job you really want and love. Uh, I appreciate the answers on that. So Evan from Kutztown University, thank you for the question. Brandon from Arkansas State University is asking a question here, and I think this is probably the most practical thing that everybody wants to know. Where do I go to find out about jobs, John? That's an that's excellent question. There, there are definitely a lot of resources, but number one, start with uh, the organizations that you might want to work for that are around your hometown. Um, obviously, if, if the area you want to live in, because every group, including Grizzlies.com, has a job listing of available positions. Uh, there are some aggregate sites like Teamwork Online um, that um, have sports industry jobs specifically. And then, again, your Monsters and Deeds, LinkedIn, they all definitely have those too. So connect with those people on LinkedIn and you'll definitely uh, see jobs pop up there. So th either start with the teams, but then you can go broader from there. Okay. Uh, that pretty much wraps up a lot of the questions. So I'm going to give everybody on the panel an opportunity to give us your one big nugget of advice to everybody who's watching this webinar. And Dennis, I'm going to start with you. Um, you know, someone just said this to me recently. We talked about keys to success and, and how to succeed in life. And, and they said three things. One, show up. Two, provide value. And three, don't be a jerk. So I think um, <laughs> you know, that, that can apply to anything you're doing in your life. So I, I like that. That, that's good. Good. Uh, Dwight, what about you? Your, your parting shot, your words of advice. 
So, so the one thing I would tell anyone is, is you will fail. Never be afraid to fail, you know, because at the end of the day, every time you fail, you get up, you pull yourself up, and you should learn from that mistake and grow from that mistake. Yeah, I, I know of a corporation that calls that failing forward. So you may fail, but as long as you're failing forward, you're doing okay. John. Uh, give me solutions, not problems. I like that. That's my, that's my favorite one. And I think uh, I said this to a former colleague of both of ours, Jason Potter, back in the day, um, who is now was with the Grizzlies back at St. Jude. Um, and, you know, that's a, a really important thing to think about. Like, uh, again, I'm, I'm here to help, but, you know, I hope people can grow and learn and come up with a solution to their own issues and we can help craft that together. So. Because there will be problems every single day or challenges. I don't, I m't mean, don't even want to use the word problems. There will be challenges every single day. Yep. It could be the pyrotechnics in the building aren't working, you know, in, in, in the game ops world or the mascot's sick or, or something. And you or always the have, fire alarm goes or off. Or the fire alarm goes off. It's been known to happen <laughs> in this building. Um, Laura, your parting shot. Sure. I think I would actually go back to um, the advice I would offer, which is always say yes. And that could be a big yes, like I'm going to take this job and move to the city, or I got invited to be part of a brainstorm or be part of a meeting or, you know, help in an event just always say yes like it will serve you well um, with the people that you're saying yes to and the people that you're working with as well because you never know Correct. who that person right. may know and this right. it really the sports industry is all about networking uh, about it, it is somewhat about who you know but it's also how you present yourself mm -hmm. and how you network and are you able to network in an effective way so we hope that this has all been very, very helpful to you. We've enjoyed bringing it to you. John and Laura, uh, Dwight and Dennis, uh, I'm Pete. Thank you so much for watching. Again, we hope you got a, a great deal out of it. We love our jobs, and I would say if there's one thing that you take away from this webinar is that if you aspire to work in sports at any level, you got to bring the passion every single day. Thank you so much for watching.